Good afternoon. Welcome to this Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis Doctor of Nursing Practice Family Nurse Practitioner Informational Webinar. We're so happy you could join us. My name is Rebecca Badeau. I'm the Communications Director for the School of Nursing, and I'll be guiding you through with our wonderful experts that we have lined up for you today. We really are glad that you could take this next hour about um, to learn more about our DNP FNP program. For the next half hour, we will highlight what um, the, some of the program components. You'll hear from a student who's actually in the inaugural cohort of the program, and we'll map out what it takes to really submit a strong application. We're also gonna leave about 30 minutes for some Q&A. So at any time during our discussion, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat, in the Q&A function actually, and we'll be getting to those um, throughout the webinar. Um, but certainly there toward the end that we're going to learn about um, what is unique about the program, what you need to do in order to position yourself well for the program. Um, we've got members of our admissions team who are also here to answer any of those nuts and bolts questions that you may not have, but that you may have. And if um, we want you also to know that we are recording this webinar, we will share it with you tomorrow via email. Um, so if you missed something and we wrap up and you still had some unanswered questions, um, you will get a recording of it tomorrow, but we'll also leave you with an email that you can reach out and get additional questions answered. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our DNP FNP program director, Dr. Catherine Sexton. Catherine. Have to work all of the unmute buttons. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> All right, so welcome. It is delightful to have everyone with us today. And thank you, Rebecca. I'm happy to be here to share with everyone a bit more about what makes our DMP FMP program truly unique. And so I thought I would share with you just a little bit of my background so that you get a sense of who I am and what brought me here. So I've been an FMP now for 18 years with a subspecialty in geriatrics. I own and operate my own practice and have been doing that for the last 15 years. I started teaching. One of those instructors that I had in undergrad found me in the grocery store and convinced me that teaching was definitely in my future. So I started as a clinical instructor in a pre-licensure program in 2001, moved into the classroom in 2002, and into advanced practice in 2004. And with that began the journey of the DNP. So I started my PhD in 2004 because there was no DNP program. So if you were going to teach or you wanted to advance your education, or if you wanted to do that scholarly project research that was always too big to do in my master's program, then you had to pursue your PhD. And during that time, the DNP came into existence and I participated in the committee work that actually developed the DNP and differentiated its goals from that of the PhD. And from there, finished my doctorate and helped design a master's to DNP program at the University of Alaska. And then the bachelor's to DNP program three years later, both of which were thankfully accredited by CCNE which then allows us all to sit for our boards. And what brought me to this school, because I spent my entire life in Alaska, was the opportunity to work on some extremely innovative projects, including the Family Caregiving Institute and developing coursework that would allow us as healthcare professionals to be more effective in our work with family caregivers. The commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion at this school. A lot of schools tend to talk about that mission and that vision in their programs, 
but the enactment of that mission isn't always as successful. And so one of the things that sold me on packing up my worldly belongings and moving to Sacramento was that commitment to moving the needle and reducing health disparities, increasing the involvement of people from diverse backgrounds within our profession so that our patients actually see people that look like them and have value systems like them. And then probably the last piece was the dedication to scholarship across all levels. So not just in the research faculty expertise, but also in our teaching expertise. Okay, you already teed up a myriad of subjects that I know we're going to get into in the next 30 <laughs> minutes. That equity piece is important. That scholarship piece obviously is very important. Can you walk us through, let, let's get to some of the basics. Walk us through the structure of the DNP FNP program at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. Uh, for example, how long does it take and, and really how does the how's the education structure? Okay. So it's a three-year program. And the first year is what we call the DNP foundational content. Right. So this is the curriculum that gives you the tools to become an agent of change. You know, understanding the financing of healthcare, how do you affect policy changes? What are the components of quality and patient safety that you need to know in order to help move the needle? Right? What are the ways that you can affect organization and system change? Looking at clinical ethics and business ethics and how those things help um, look at the complete picture and be thinking about things on a global level instead of an isolated one perspective level. How do we use data in our decisions clinically and in the, at the system level? How does evidence guide our decision making? How do you become a leader? What's the theory of why we do what we do? So that's all in the first year. Um, also looking at population health. So really moving us from that individual patient in the room at the bedside to thinking about things on a more global scale as far as different patient populations and how do we affect change at that level. The second and third year have a clinical focus the foundational part of your clinical work happens in the beginning of the second year. There is a clinical skills immersion where you'll come to campus in that second year where you learn to do all the fun procedural kind of things and do your checkups for assessment and learn to do sensitive exams, things that we may not have learned in nursing school. And then your clinical rotations actually begin in the middle of that second year and extend through the end of the program. In the third year, we kind of pull all of that together. And so wait, how the things that you learned in the first year to be an agent of change, the things that you've seen in your clinical rotations and your clinical experiences, identifying areas where we have an opportunity to affect change either at the micro level or the macro system level with the goal of changing patient outcomes for the better. And that component is what makes up your scholarly project. So I have to ask you, you know, you talked about you earning your PhD and most people, you know, that's the kind of the complimentary um, doctoral program on the research side. Is a scholarly project like a dissertation would be in the PhD realm or, or how is it different? So what's different about the DNP project is it's really translating that evidence into practice. Right. There's that 17 year gap, which is a really scary gap between when we make discoveries in our research realm and then actually implement it in practice. 
And so with the DNP, the scholarly projects, and then the continued life's work is really looking at how do we translate that research into the clinical setting. Sometimes that means when we try to do that, it doesn't work like it did in a controlled environment. And so back to our PhD colleagues to collaborate to figure out how we make that translation more effective and efficient. So we have a question I wanna qu quickly get to while we're on this topic. Do you have to come in knowing what your scholarly project is? No. <laughs> and I would say that even when people do, some people have a really good sort of idea about where they think they want to go. But as your breadth of understanding and the depth that you go into expands and then a lot of times people are coming in with their nursing lens right in that acute care environment and then they get into primary care and it's like oh my goodness I had no idea what I really want to do is this piece right so nice to have an idea kind of helps you with is there the expertise to help me do that on the faculty Right. but not mandatory by any means that you have that coming in because it will evolve as you evolve. Hopefully that'll take a little weight off of, <laughs> of the application <laughs> process. Um, okay, so in the spirit of transparency, this is when I say I have a very clear bias. I love our <laughs> program. You're coming from a biased lens as well, but moving up about 30,000 feet, Mm -hmm. with what is unique? I mean, obviously, you've been in the creation of DNP programs and a part of DN program, DNP programs for many years. What is unique about this program that you have led an incredible team in the creation of? So with this program, I would say the most unique thing is the focus on reducing health inequities, reducing health disparities to truly move the needle while people are in their program so that it's not something you learn from a book. So hopefully Catherine will share some of that with us when she has a chance to do that. But really we, in the first year, part of the start of the program is an immersive experience where we take a trip into the underserved areas of our state to really look at what health is, what the disparities are, things that you may never have considered prior to. You know, a lot of times we think very clinically about health inequities and we don't expand into what are the social aspects, what are the political aspects that truly impact the ability to reduce the disparities. And so I think that that's probably the most unique part of our program, integration of patient quality and safety, which I'm sure Dr. Bakurjian will talk about a little bit coming soon. And then also the commitment to innovative solutions. If we knew how to do it, I think we would all have done it by now. So thinking outside the box, being committed to you know, that ability to acknowledge that we're all going to fail at some point. But the reason we fail is because we're pushing an envelope. Right? So if you don't give yourself permission to not be perfect, you never actually try anything new because you're gonna do what's tried and true. We know it doesn't work. So I think that integration of health equity, the bold leadership and that innovative clinical practice are really what make us unique. Well, you you hinted at Dr. Bakurjian. I'm gonna bring Dr. Deb Bakurjian into our conversation now. She was one of the members of that amazing team I mentioned earlier. She is a professor and our associate dean for practice here at the School of Nursing. Welcome, Deb. And you know, Deb, I should probably mention, 
Um, I'm calling everyone by first names once we get the conversation going. It's not to diminish anyone's scholarly pursuits or accomplishments. We just want this to be a little bit more informal. Um, so welcome, Deb, and tell us a little bit more about your role in the DNP FNP program. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Um, well, I have to say that the process of putting together this uh, program was a huge collaborative effort between many School of Nursing faculty. There was a group of which I was a part of that focused on the year one academic section that, that uh, Dr. Sexton uh, described earlier. And then many more of our DNP faculty in particular who specifically worked on the FNP curriculum content under Dr. Sexton's leadership. Once the curriculum plan was finalized, we it then goes to what we have here, which is kind of unique at UC Davis, the Nursing Science and Healthcare Leadership Graduate Group, um, which many universities don't have, but we're lucky to have because it is comprised of faculty from our School of Nursing, as well as uh, faculty from the School of Medicine and, and faculty from the main campus, which gives us this wonderful broad uh, collective thought uh, opportunities to bounce things off each other and get different perspectives. So it's quite a diverse group. They are responsible for overseeing the curriculum development and the admission processes. Currently, I'm the chair of the Education Policy and Curriculum Development Committee for this school. And I'm also the chair of the DNP Admissions Subcommittee. So I've certainly been personally involved all along the way in these, um, in these activities. But I want to take just a minute to, to briefly talk about my teaching role, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, and that was for this program to develop the quality and patient safety course and work with other faculty to link some of that content across the year one courses. As you can imagine, ensuring that patients receive high quality and safe care is particularly important for all healthcare providers. But for our doctorally prepared FNPs, they need to have a specific focus on this because they will likely be the clinicians who lead the quality and safety efforts for their clinics. And patient safety is really important for all FNPs to understand as there are patient safety risks that are specific to the role of providers, such as understanding the causes and being able to reduce diagnostic errors, which are a leading cause of medical errors and have a lot of focus uh, in uh, right now in this past couple of years. So in the first year course, Enhancing Quality and Safety in Healthcare, students learn the fundamentals of patient safety and quality improvement. And I really encourage them, even though many of them may not know the theories, may not know the specific tools, they've had clinical experiences and life experiences that they can link the, these principles too. And that really helps them to reinforce the work that they, they do across the, the course while they're learning the, um, the, those principles and learning how to use the tools. I can say I'm also really excited about our curriculum and our program. I think the students are enjoying it and I know the faculty are enjoying it. One of the greatest things about being on the ground floor of a new program is that you get to work closely with the students on improving the course, and that is really rewarding. So you mentioned the clinical experience that, that individuals have before they apply to this program. Let's talk about that application process, because I know those experiences are going to be an important thing to highlight. Kind of walk us through what folks will see when they begin to apply. Certainly. So applications for the June 2023 enrollment in the DNP FNP program are now open. You can go to our website for all the specific details, but I'm gonna share just a few of them. Um, you need a current RN license and one year of RN experience, a bachelor's degree, and a minimum bachelor's degree GPA of 3.0. While we require a minimum of 2.7 GPA in all of our science prerequisite courses, a 3.0 GPA is actually preferred even in those science um, courses. You will need three letters of recommendation, a statement of purpose and additional essays, and then the application process may require an interview. 
However, you'll be happy to know that the GRE is not required. Um, you'll be able to review our website for all of the specifics uh, around this. But let me say a little bit more about the science prerequisites. You are going to need one course in anatomy, human anatomy with a lab, one course in human physiology with a lab, or a human anatomy and physiology series could be part one and part two also with a lab. You need one course in chemistry with a lab and one course in microbiology or bacteriology with a lab. And I'll just say that we really prefer that the human anatomy and human physiology prerequisites be completed within the last five years of when you want to apply. Also, good news, statistics is waived for the 2023 enrollees, although we strongly encourage students who are admitted to the program to complete uh, statistics in the, in the first year. And then I want to go on and talk a little bit about how to go about in applying for the program. There are, of course, detailed instructions on the website, but you will need to create an account through grad studies to submit your application. Um, and the application includes additional documents, a CV or resume, for example. Uh, you'll need to get electronic copies of your transcripts from all of your colleges and universities. And most importantly, for you to think about how you respond to the short essay questions um, that, you, uh, that ask you to complete a statement of purpose that describes your experiences that have prepared you and motivated you to apply for this program. You should also speak to your formal and informal leadership any special interests, involvement in uh, innovative practice change, your future career goals, and how those align with the mission and vision of our program. Uh, you will also need to do a diversity statement. Uh, it's obviously very important, as uh, Catherine mentioned earlier, about our program and, and what makes us unique. You need three letters of recommendation, which I mentioned earlier, but I want to emphasize that it's really, really important to get started on those letters early. These are typically the last things that come in on all of the applications. So um, get started early so you can allow for time to get them completed and submitted. The deadline for those submissions are January 15th. When you go about getting your letters of recommendation, make sure you ask for you ask professional contacts um, who can speak to your strengths and opportunities for growth, your potential for completing the program, and your ability to move forward with a successful career as an FNP. Please include people who can speak to your academic or clinical uh, performance and be current with that in the last few years, rather than your best friend, uh, a colleague that you worked with five years ago, um, or a family member. And also, don't be afraid to provide a draft letter of support or at least a bulleted list of what to include in that letter. Again, applications close uh, 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on January 15th for full consideration. And the final application deadline is June 1st for space available consideration. On the website, there is a, a wonderful, important link to a how to apply PDF document that really gives you very specific um, uh, uh, guidelines. And again, you will be applying online via the UC Davis Graduate Studies. Okay, lots of information there. Now I wanna to go to someone who a year ago was in this position doing the exact same thing. <laughs> Catherine Kawanja, who is a brave front, you know, pioneer in our inaugural cohort. Catherine, does it seem like it's been a full year that you were kind of asking yourself these questions and seeking these letters? It is crazy that how fast time has passed on. Um, it does not feel like it was has been a full year. It feels like it was yesterday that I was in, you know, these people's shoes. Um, yeah, but just it's it, time has gone by extremely fast. So what was your nursing background when you were applying to the program before you started? So I previously got my bachelor's of science in public health, and then I got my master's of science in nursing. 
I've been a nurse for a little over two years. Um, I've worked like, primarily in bedside, so in pediatrics specifically, so the acute care settings that we all know, so like medical surgical or step down units. Um, during the pandemic, I also had the opportunity to work as a public health nurse with my county's public health department. So I was working with people experiencing homelessness and just providing care to uh, those needing like isolation and management of the COVID-19 symptoms at the time. So after all that education and then boots on the ground real experience, why did you decide to pursue the DNP? Yeah, so great question. So my interest really sparked two years ago during the rise of COVID-19 and the surge of like racial violence and biases that was happening through our country. Um, it was right when I first became a nurse and I noticed that there was specifically like a medical mistrust within my community that really prompted me to consider the DMP program. Um, I saw many people in my community refusing or hesitant to get the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. And I knew that it wasn't that these individuals didn't want to get the vaccine, it was something deeper. And I that made me realize that it was a historical, like systematic failure within our healthcare that has led this medical mistrust and disassociation between patient and provider relationship. So that's why I considered the DMP FMP program to really allow me to expand my career, um, my knowledge, and really become, like Dr. Sexton had stated, a change agent um, outside of just being bedside or within an organization, but truly within a population that I wanted to serve. Um, so it really prompted me to like, want to achieve this and provide and promote optimal health and wellness um, and partner with these like marginalized communities and bring awareness to addressing health inequities and health disparities that were um, ultimately impacting their well-being. So clearly you had a vision of where you wanted to take these questions you were asking based on what you had witnessed during COVID. When researching schools, because you're in Southern California, when yes. researching schools, what prompted you to say the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis, that's the one? So I knew that the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing was the one that I wanted to go to to achieve my career goals was because my career objective aligned with the school's visions. Um, and their core values. So I know that we had stated it earlier, but really the emphasis of promoting optimal health, health equity, really trying to obtain these leadership roles. Um, the school has a commitment to really prepare its students to truly bring change within a healthcare and at a system level where it can be either local or global. And you see this within the program structure from you know, the courses that we take, the curriculum, um, to even the you know, diversity that I've seen amongst the faculty and the students. Um, it's inclusivity of like all different backgrounds and opportunity um, really allowed me to, you know, be exposed to this way of thinking and really aid in the confidence um, to become a healthcare leader. So you're a few months in and I want to know what it's been like because there was no one for you to ask. I mean, this was a brand new program and really you had the website, the vision, and hopefully visiting with some faculty in advance to learn more about it. But what has it been like? It has been exciting, but also challenging. Um, insight, exciting in terms of being exposed to like these intellectual discussions and opportunities that influence and um, lead you to closer to your career goals. 
I would say challenging in terms of balancing work, life, and school. Um, I am a first generation student. I um, am the only one that is has really gone to college. Um, so however, the faculty and staff have been very supportive. They've been really understanding um, of our challenges since day one. You never feel alone. You always feel like there's someone there with you in these situations. I mean, I have colleagues um, that are in the same situation as mine. Um, many of us are still working full time. Many of us have families and um, partners that we care for. Um, as well as the faculty really being flexible and understanding of the challenges we face, you know, along this journey. So clearly it's a hybrid program and the bulk of it is you at home and in your community working and, and studying. But in September, you all came together for your first of four on-site emergent experiences uh, and you got on a bus, you took a bus trip and this was not a typical bus trip. Share with us a little bit about what that experience was, how it was connecting with your cohort members, you know, in person, and then kind of the, 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 the lens it set for you or the, the stage it set for you moving forward in, um, in studies. And I know that's a, that's a three-part question, but I, yeah. I have to be honest, it, was, it was a profound experience. I understand. No, definitely. It was a life-changing experience. It was so enlightening. Um, I mean, first I was able to meet my colleagues in person. So now that when we have these, you know, Zoom sessions and online and these discussions online, I really know how to connect and build upon the relationship that I already started in person, as well as we had the privilege to go into like these various communities along the Central Valley. And it really allowed you to remove the lens of being a healthcare provider and become a learner of their community. Until this trip, I did not know and the historical significance within these communities and how what they had on our nation. I remember being as young as I can remember that I would drive up and down the five and just thought that, you know, okay, there's just farmland, it's just a road instead of getting me back up to San Francisco or the Bay Area, then I'm going to come right back down. But this experience has really allowed me to reshape my knowledge and the vocabulary of how I intersect and merge culture and health when providing patient care and as a provider. Um, not only that, but it's, it showed me the importance of cultural humility in terms of we're not going there to be competent. We're going there to learn from them and build lifelong partnerships with these communities to make change. So this opportunity was something that you, like Dr. Sexton had stated earlier, you can't learn from a book. And I think that's why, why I appreciate this school so much, because they allow these life-changing opportunities and exposures than any other school that I've ever been to, to really allow you to reshape your way of thinking and ultimately lead you to become a healthcare leader. We've got some questions coming in, but the last one I wanna ask of you before I, I skip to this next part is, um, so how is the online learning? I mean, clearly when you're in a bus immersed in the Central Valley, that is quite a rich, robust experience, but how have you found um, the different online formats when you meet, when it's you know synchronous, when it's asynchronous, how's that been? So I have enjoyed it. Um, we have asynchronous and synchronous sessions online. So our synchronous sessions um, are probably around like once a week or every other week. Um, the faculty, what I appreciate is that the faculty really wants you to learn. And I remember being in nursing school, I was learning off of intimidation because of the fear of failing a test or failing an exam um, because you wanted to move on with your cohort. But in this, um, you know, what I've experienced here is that our assignments have enhanced our learning in a different way. So we've seen discussions, we've seen case studies, we see, we do projects all online. Um, 
And overall, it's been a great experience. Um, I appreciate the flexibility of it being asynchronous. It really accommodates to the nursing work schedule of working, whether you work days or nights, um, and allows you to, yeah, again, have that flexibility. Well, I appreciate you sharing as you're in, with us your insights. Don't go anywhere because we do have uh, some questions coming in and the student perspective may be quite um, worthwhile. I do want to encourage those of you who haven't, if there's a burning question you have, just put it in the Q&A um, and we'll, we'll jump to some right now. So Kath, uh, Catherine Sexton, I may have to say Dr. Sexton now, so we have two Catherines on the, on the meeting, but um, Dr. Sexton, um, Give us an example of a scholarly project. I, the, we do have the question, of what is an example that someone has done in the past? Well, being as this is the first year of the program, no one's gotten to year three yet. But could you tell us a little bit about how you see those scholarly projects moving forward? So we actually have partners in the community who are waiting with bated breath for some of our students, hoping that their goals and the partner's goals align with each other to work on some changes within their system. So we have one partner who does a lot of work with the homeless population who would love to have students participate in a project to develop strategies for trust building with the homeless population in a more um, I guess more efficient way right now, what they see in their practice is it takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months to really start to build a relationship with their clients. And so are there things that we can do differently that would help expedite that building of trust with that population? So that is one area. Another area of a project that I had the privilege to participate in was to reduce the recidivism in um, returns to correctional facilities that were the result of substance use disorder and setting up a system where when people were released from the prison system who had substance use disorder, they were connected before ever leaving with recovery programs and a provider to help them through that transition and continue the good work that they had started in the prison system to remain in recovery. So the wheels are already turning, I can see. Um, <laughs> speaking of the, the clinical sites, we do have a couple of um, clinical related questions. So number one, um, can you provide examples that the program currently has partnerships with? And then how do you help students find clinical placements? Do they have to find them or are they provided? Um, so we have a process. <laughs> so we have a clinical team that actually helps us locate clinical sites for all of our students. So unlike many programs that say, gosh, thank you for participating in our program. Now you go find your clinical site and then we'll vet them and make sure they're okay. We actually do that process. We do take um, suggestions from students. We have things that are called memorandums of agreement between part practices and the school. So if we have one that exists, we can certainly do that. If we don't, then we can work on it. Um, we have partnerships all over the state of California. And so we're really hoping that with our students, we're able to find placements for them in their communities, because we know that when we pull people out of their communities for extended periods of time, they sometimes don't return to those communities that were the impetus for them to actually pursue their advanced education in the first place. What else can I say? So I believe we've got a, a link on the website where folks, and, and we're gonna follow up in the email, but what is that link um, in regards to um, soliciting ideas for clinical placements? Right, so on the website, there's the DNP FMP questionnaire link. 
And in there, it asks you about where you're hoping to do your clinical rotations, where you live now, those type of questions. And we actually use that information. We share it with our clinical team. Do we already have placements in those areas or do we need to look beyond that? We have some wonderful partnerships with the federally qualified health centers. Is that an opportunity based on where people are hoping to have their clinicals that we can utilize with that particular student? And so it really helps give us a jump on making sure that we have the resources and the sites available so that students don't have to relocate. Excellent. And I did mention we will tomorrow in the follow up email, we will have a link to that questionnaire. Um, so you don't have to go scrambling for it now. Um, Deb, I want to ask you a question regarding um, those letters of recommendation that you mentioned earlier and kind of prompting your recommenders to, to, to say what, what aspects you, you want them to say. Do you want all three letters to echo the same things? Or is it more strategic for each of your recommenders to kind of speak to um, certain attributes or experiences or strengths that you have that all complement the, the application process? Or is it stronger when they all three say the same thing? Well, I, I think it's probably more strategic for them to, um, for each of the letters to have a slightly different focus. And it would make some sense, right? Because your relationship and what you did with that particular present, uh, person who's going to um, make the recommendation has been different. But there, is, there are certain things that you want to make sure that they do speak to. Things like your leadership, your uh, willingness to be innovative, your, um, your uh, skill sets in terms of um, relationships with patients and other staff. Uh, those kinds of things you want to have them speak to those, even though the setting might be different. It might be a different kind of um, practice that you were uh, participating in, or it may have been a not a clinical practice, but maybe an academic um, uh, environment that you were working with somebody. So um, I, I think um, if you put the three letters together, when you if you put the three people together and think about what your relationships are, if there are certain aspects that make better sense for one to speak to versus another, that, that's perfectly fine. Just be thoughtful about it, get the request for letters out early, and, um, and then and provide them some content, something about what you've been do doing that will help them to craft a really good letter. That's that, yeah, that, those are good tips. Um, for the diversity statement, I'm curious, is, is the statement to focus on your support of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or your the experiences that you're bringing. For example, Catherine mentioned she's a first-generation college student. That's clearly one of those kind of diversity perspectives. Um, or is it a combination of both? For that yeah, I, think it, I think it's a combination of both things. Um, uh, experiences are powerful. If you've had experiences, uh, whether that be um, first-generation college, which I am also Catherine, um, but it, it, it's, it's also other kinds of experiences and challenges that you may have had. Um, it, 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 the, it may be uh, a socioeconomic, it might be a gender diversity, it might be um, a race or ethnicity, it might be, you know, you can look at many different things that, that look, um, uh, that highlight your experiences with diversity. And I would really encourage people to really think about it from the health equity lens, because we know as clinicians that we have terrible inequities in our health system. They come from social um, determinants of health. They come from structural racism. They come from a lot of different areas. And I think if you can speak to some of that and have a personal experience that complements that or highlights that, um, that would be really helpful. Catherine, is that something that you looked at in your application from that frontline experience that you were talking about that you noticed in COVID with the vaccine hesitancy and some of those questions? 
Yes, um, during when I was preparing for my application, I really focused on, like Dr. Um, B had stated, the health inequities that I had saw within my own community and how I wanted, I had this urge to want to implement change. And that's my reasoning of wanting to apply to the DMP FMP program. So I, as a applicant, I would really, you know, advise to emphasize on those experiences of what makes you or prompts you to really be a change agent within your community or within globally or systemically. Um, so that's one of the things that I would focus on as well. Very good advice. Um, Catherine with the K, Dr. Sexton, um, question about financial uh, obligations of students. How, how, how is the program run as far as cost and, and fi financial commitment? And so we are quite blessed to have generous financial support from the school side that actually translates to students to cover approximately 30% of in-state tuition and fees for the program. There are specific details about financial support that are part of our admissions offer, the links to our financial aid office, we really do try to help students minimize the expense at the end of the program, right? So you're not walking away with huge debt on the other side. That's always a good thing to hear, especially as we're nearing the end of the year and then tax time will be here. Um, so earlier, um, Deb, you were mentioning our you know, grad group and our interprofessional approach. I think even Catherine is mentioning the diversity that she's seeing in the, in the professors that are teaching courses. How do um, folks, when they're looking into kind of what their interests are, maybe in that scholarly project or at least kind of an area, is it a good idea to kind of see who within the faculty maybe shares some of those, those same interests? How does that work? Yeah, I think that that it's um, it is a really good thing to look in the faculty for people for people who may have some alignment, but I think it's also an opportunity to really broaden your your thinking about things. And in addition to our own faculty, we have an entire school of medicine and a, and a, an entire university uh, full of faculty who do tremendous work. So one of the things that happens is that each of the students will get an advisor and that advisor along with your regular faculty will really help you to think more about who you might link with. I, I encourage all of the uh, applicants to go onto our website and look at our own faculty to see the diversity of interest in our faculty um, and expertise, but we will also help you to find others uh, that, that will align with what your interests are or help you to think through how you might go about uh, working on a project. So uh, you'll have a lot of partnership with the faculty in doing that. Excellent. I'll put a little plug in. If anyone wants to ask a question, get it in now um, as we're about to wind up. Uh, but Catherine Sexton, Dr. Sexton, um, what does mentorship look like for faculty and leadership here at the School of Nursing? So Rebecca, to clarify, for the faculty or for the students? Well, from <laughs> the faculty to the students, how do we mentor these future DMP FMPs? So we actually have advisors that are assigned with each student. So we have that link. They need a minimum of quarterly and more often if it works out for the student, as Catherine said, they're balancing a lot of things. So sometimes it's more an email check-in when things are needed or just to say hi. Um, and then as progression through the program happens, they'll have um, a chair for their scholarly project, they'll select someone and collaborate with them to help guide them through the development of the project. We also have community mentors to help students transition into the community. We have people who will help with the dissemination of what students discover in their projects so that that 
knowledge doesn't rest with us, but actually gets out into the profession and into communities about things that are working, as well as, you know, we've all done projects, I think, Dr. B, um, that we had this great idea that we were gonna get 47,000 people who were going to participate in our study because everybody in the world would be obviously as interested in it as we were, and that didn't work out. But why didn't it work out, right? So sometimes it's about why didn't people participate? How would I do that differently in the future? So even if you don't affect the change you were hoping to, there's still great value in the project. And so we mentor students on how do you talk about those pieces of things as well as the great successes that you've had. So you know, we have monthly meetings that are available that are optional for students to drop in and visit with faculty. So there's a wide breadth of ways that we reach out. And of course, everybody has our emails and pretty much all of our cell numbers. So <laughs> I see Catherine is nodding, Catherine Koanja. Um, have you found faculty to be accessible, uh, um, accessible and responsive? Yes, I feel like that has been the biggest help in this transition of starting this DNP program is how accessible the staff has been and the faculty. They are, I mean, once you've sent the email, they'll probably respond within 30 minutes to an hour. Um, whether you call them, email them, they are always there to, you know, a, you know, route you to the um, answer that you need. Um, and overall, I've had a great experience. I would say that the faculty has been very helpful, though. So we have a question also following up with you, Catherine. How did you juggle it all? You mentioned you're working full time. You're taking care of family. How, how, how difficult is it? Um, and are other members of your cohort juggling some of the same things you are? Yes. So you can't juggle it all by yourself. Um, you have to, a lot of my cohorts are as well in the same position as I am, but you really, I feel like the importance of it is really communicating with your family and your loved ones before um, entering this program and really state with them the, you know, challenges that you may face and, um, you know, communicate with them that I'm not always going to be at every single party or I may need assistance with washing the dishes or washing the clothes. So I feel like when you are transparent and you alleviate some of that stress that um, can be taken off of you and, you know, given to some one of your loved ones will really aid um, in the success of the program. That's that is excellent advice from someone who's living it right now. And Dr. Saxon, I see you nodding. Is this kind of where that perfectionism needs to take a back seat so that you can lean on others and get by with what you need to get by with, but maybe not be perfect in everything? Absolutely. And I think one of the big things I can speak for myself was being vulnerable to say to my family and friends, I can't do it all. I'm not going to talk to you for the next month because I've got all of these deadlines, but no, I still think about you at three o'clock in the morning or at midnight because that happens to be my great creative zone, right? So being honest with folks, reaching out for the help. If you need to hire somebody, some folks have actually hired housekeepers during school to come in once a month to sort of do that clean that you're not doing while you're in school. You know, there are different strategies. You don't have to prepare every meal from scratch. <laughs> there are things that you can give up and you just have to look at where your priorities are and how you accommodate those to the best of your abilities, making sure that you have things like date night so that month isn't with the person that you're not talking to them for the month, those folks you want to make sure to get on your schedule. 
<laughs> dishing out really good life lessons. <laughs> Let me circle back before we run out of time, because we do have a, a couple more questions related to faculty interests. Mm -hmm. Is there a place to find a list of faculty advisors um, on the website for this specific program? And what if you're not really finding a faculty member that has a you know, specific interest of yours? And so in the faculty component on the website, any of the faculty who are doctorally prepared can serve as chair for our DMP projects. I saw the note about someone interested in palliative and hospice care. So if we don't have the expertise on the faculty, I do know that we do have folks who are passionate about that area. But for example, let's say that we didn't, we also have connections in the community with people who are involved in palliative care and hospice, who then we would connect you with for that content expertise. And then the how in the world do I put the project together expertise would come from faculty. So can I just add something to, to that as well? We, we in addition to our own faculty, we have um, School of Medicine faculty, we have clinicians in the health system, we, um, who we also connect with um, and work closely with. So there, there is really an unending, uh, almost um, a number of people that, um, that our students can work with uh, on their scholarly projects. So I, I, it would be really surprising to not be able to find someone since this is a clinically oriented program that um, for them to work with. And I'm glad you mentioned that. Thanks, Deb, because this is we're a part of an academic health system. We have a very deep bench, as as they say in basketball. Um, Dr. Deb Bakersian, Catherine uh, Kawanja, our inaugural cohort student, thank you both so much for joining us. Dr. Sexton, in this last couple of minutes, I just wanted to open it up um, to see if you had any um, final thoughts for those who are now um, deciding whether they're going to submit the application and how to make it the best they can make it. So I would say, you know, if you're asking yourself, do I really want a DMP, FNP? The big question is, do I want to have the ability to make change beyond the patient in the room with me? If the answer to that question is yes, then you're thinking in the right vein of where to go with your career. If you're thinking, you know, why this program, if you're truly interested in moving the needle on health inequity, changing practice so that we are delivering the best care we possibly can, changing constraints, right? The only barriers we truly have are the ones that we set for ourselves. There's always a way to create change. It may not happen in the moment, but over time, those things can evolve. If you develop a scholarly project in the program and it still has phase two and three, Right, so then how do we link people coming behind you to continue to help make those changes? And you may very well become the community member expert on that scholarly project committee when that time comes. If you want to keep the nurse in nurse practitioner, I would say that's the other more unique thing about our program is that we deliberately didn't focus in the clinical year only on the medicine, but truly that holistic approach to care that is so integral to what it means to be a nurse practitioner. It's not just the medicine, it's not just our nursing, but it's that wonderful integration of the two. Then I would wholeheartedly advocate for you to complete your application. If you wanna chat, I'm absolutely available. I know that Madeline and her team field questions from people all the time, get them out to the right folks to answer those questions. 
So don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Dr. Sexton. Excellent plug. And we're serious. We like to hear from you. So here are some great emails and some resources all up on the screen. Remember that application clo applications close on January the 15th, um, which will be here before we know it. Uh, and um, remember, we're going to have a survey when we wrap up this webinar. So we really hope that you would fill that survey out. It helps us do our jobs better so that we're giving you the information that you need. Um, and of course, a recording of this along with that DNP questionnaire will be followed up tomorrow with you via email. So thank you so much for taking a bit of your time today to learn more about the DNP FNP program at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. From all of us here at the School of Nursing, be well. <laughs>